Chapter 7 of the Chronicles of Avonlea. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Chronicles of Avonlea by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter 7 Aunt Olivia's Bow, Part 1. Aunt Olivia told Peggy and me about him on the afternoon we went over to help her gather her late roses for potpourri. We found her strangely quiet and preoccupied. As a rule she was fond of mild fun, alert to hear East Grafton gossip, and given to sudden little trills of almost girlish laughter, which for the time being dispelled the atmosphere of gentle old maidishness which seemed to hang about her as a garment. At such moments we did not find it hard to believe, as we did at other times, that Aunt Olivia had once been a girl herself. This day she picked the roses absently, and shook the fairy petals into her little sweet grass basket with the air of a woman whose thoughts were far away. We said nothing, knowing that Aunt Olivia's secrets always came our way in time. When the rose leaves were picked, we carried them in and upstairs in single file, Aunt Olivia bringing up the rear to pick up any stray rose leaf we might drop. In the southwest room, where there was no carpet to fade, we spread them on newspapers on the floor. Then we put our sweet grass baskets back in the proper place, in the proper closet, in the proper room. What would have happened to us, or to the sweet grass baskets, if this had not been done, I do not know. Nothing was ever permitted to remain an instant out of place in Aunt Olivia's house. When we went downstairs, Aunt Olivia asked us to go into the parlor. She had something to tell us, she said, and as she opened the door a delicate pink flush spread over her face. I noted it with surprise, but no inkling of the truth came to me, for nobody ever connected the idea of possible lovers or marriage with this prim little old maid, Olivia Sterling. Aunt Olivia's parlor was much like herself, painfully neat. Every article of furniture stood in exactly the same place it had always stood. Nothing was ever suffered to be disturbed. The tassels of the crazy cushion lay just so over the arm of the sofa, and the crochet antimacassar was always spread at precisely the same angle over the horsehair rocking chair. No speck of dust was ever visible, no fly ever invaded that sacred apartment. Aunt Olivia pulled up a blind to let in what light could sift finely through the vine leaves and sat down in a high-backed old chair that had appertained to her great-grandmother. She folded her hands in her lap and looked at us with shy appeal in her blue-gray eyes. Plainly she found it hard to tell us her secret, yet all the time there was an air of pride and exultation about her, somewhat also of a new dignity. Aunt Olivia could never be self-assertive, but if it had been possible, that would have been her time for it. "'Have you ever heard me speak of Mr. Malcolm MacPherson?' asked Aunt Olivia. We had never heard her or anybody else speak of Mr. Malcolm MacPherson, but volumes of explanation could not have told us more about him than did Aunt Olivia's voice when she pronounced his name. We knew, as if it had been proclaimed to us in trumpet tones, that Mr. Malcolm MacPherson must be Aunt Olivia's beau, and the knowledge took away our breath. We even forgot to be curious, so astonished were we. And there sat Aunt Olivia, proud and shy and exulting and shamefaced, all at once. He is a brother of Mrs. John Seaman's across the bridge, explained Aunt Olivia with a little simper. Of course you don't remember him. He went out to British Columbia twenty years ago. But he is coming home now, and—and and tell your father, won't you? I—I I don't like to tell him. Mr. Malcolm MacPherson and I are going to be married. Married? gasped Peggy. And married, I echoed stupidly. Aunt Olivia bridled a little. There is nothing unsuitable in that, is there? she asked rather crisply. "'Oh, no, no,' I hastened to assure her, giving Peggy a surreptitious kick to divert her thoughts from laughter. "'Only you must realize, Aunt Olivia, that this is a very great surprise to us.' "'I thought it would be so,' said Aunt Olivia complacently. "'But your father will know. He will remember. I do hope he won't think me foolish. He did not think Mr. Malcolm MacPherson was a fit person for me to marry once. But that was long ago, when Mr. Malcolm MacPherson was very poor.' He is in very comfortable circumstances now. Tell us about it, Aunt Olivia, said Peggy. 
She did not look at me, which was my salvation. Had I caught Peggy's eye when Aunt Olivia said Mr. Malcolm MacPherson in that tone, I must have laughed willy-nilly. When I was a girl, the MacPhersons used to live across the road from here. Mr. Malcolm MacPherson was my beau then. But my family, and your father especially, dear me, I hope he won't be very cross, were opposed to his attentions and were very cool to him. I think that was why he never said anything to me about getting married then. And after a time he went away, as I have said, and I never heard anything from him directly for many a year. Of course his sister sometimes gave me news of him. But last June I had a letter from him. He said he was coming home to settle down for good on the old island, and he asked me if I would marry him. I wrote back and said I would. Perhaps I ought to have consulted your father, but I was afraid he would think I ought to refuse Mr. Malcolm MacPherson. Oh, I don't think father will mind, said Peggy reassuringly. I hope not, because of course I would consider it my duty in any case to fulfill the promise I have given to Mr. Malcolm MacPherson. He will be in Grafton next week, the guest of his sister, Mrs. John Seaman, across the bridge. Aunt Olivia said that exactly as if she were reading it from the personal column of the Daily Enterprise. "'When is the wedding to be?' I asked. "'Oh!' Aunt Olivia blushed distressfully. "'I do not know the exact date. Nothing can be definitely settled until Mr. Malcolm MacPherson comes. But it will not be before September at the earliest. There will be so much to do.' "'You will tell your father, won't you?' "'We promised that we would, and Aunt Olivia arose with an air of relief. "'Peggy and I hurried over home, stopping when we were safely out of earshot, to laugh. "'The romances of the middle-aged may be to them as tender and sweet as those of youth, "'but they are apt to possess a good deal of humor for onlookers. "'Only youth can be sentimental without being mirth-provoking.' We loved Aunt Olivia, and were glad for her late, new-blossoming happiness, but we felt amused over it also. The recollection of her Mr. Malcolm MacPherson was too much for us every time we thought of it. Father pooh-poohed incredulously at first, and, when we had convinced him, guffawed with laughter. Aunt Olivia need not have dreaded any more opposition from her cruel family. "'McPherson was a good fellow enough, but horribly poor,' said Father. "'I hear he has done very well out west, and if he and Olivia have a notion of each other, they are welcome to marry, as far as I am concerned. Tell Olivia she mustn't take a spasm if he tracks some mud into her house once in a while.' Thus it was all arranged, and before we realized it at all, Aunt Olivia was mid-deep in marriage preparations, in all of which Peggy and I were quite indispensable.' She consulted us in regard to everything, and we almost lived at her place in those days preceding the arrival of Mr. Malcolm MacPherson. Aunt Olivia plainly felt very happy and important. She had always wished to be married, she was not in the least strong-minded, and her old maidenhood had always been a sore point with her. I think she looked upon it as somewhat of a disgrace. And yet she was a born old maid, looking at her, and taking all her primness and little set ways into consideration, it was quite impossible to picture her as the wife of Mr. Malcolm MacPherson or anybody else. We soon discovered that, to Aunt Olivia, Mr. Malcolm MacPherson represented a merely abstract proposition, the man who was to confer on her the long-withheld dignity of matronhood. Her romance began and ended there, although she was quite unconscious of this herself and believed that she was deeply in love with him. What will be the result, Mary, when he arrives in the flesh and she is compelled to deal with Mr. Malcolm MacPherson as a real live man instead of a nebulous party of the second part in the marriage ceremony, queried Peggy as she hemmed table napkins for Aunt Olivia, sitting on her well-scoured sandstone steps, and carefully putting all thread clippings and ravelings into the little basket which Aunt Olivia had placed there for that purpose. It may transform her from a self-centered old maid into a woman for whom marriage does not seem such an incongruous thing, I said. The day on which Mr. Malcolm MacPherson was expected, Peggy and I went over. We had planned to remain away, thinking that the lovers would prefer their first meeting to be unwitnessed, but Aunt Olivia insisted on our being present. She was plainly nervous. The abstract was becoming concrete. Her little house was in spotless, speckless order from top to bottom. Aunt Olivia had herself scrubbed the garret floor and swept the cellar steps that very morning with as much painstaking care as if she expected that Mr. Malcolm MacPherson would hasten to expect each at once and she must stand or fall by his opinion of them. Peggy and I helped her to dress. She insisted on wearing her best black silk in which she looked unnaturally fine. 
Her soft muslin became her much better, but we could not induce her to wear it. Anything more prim and bandboxy than Aunt Olivia when her toilette was finished it has never been my lot to see. Peggy and I watched her as she went downstairs, her skirt held stiffly up all around her that it might not brush the floor. Mr. Malcolm MacPherson will be inspired with such awe that he will only be able to sit back and gaze at her, whispered Peggy. I wish he would come and have it over. This is getting on my nerves. Aunt Olivia went into the parlor, settled herself in the old carved chair, and folded her hands. Peggy and I sat down on the stairs to await his coming in a crisping suspense. Aunt Olivia's kitten, a fat, bewhiskered creature, looking as if it were cut out of black velvet, shared our vigil and purred in maddening peace of mind. We could see the garden path and gate through the hall window, and therefore supposed we should have full warning of the approach of Mr. Malcolm MacPherson. It was no wonder, therefore, that we positively jumped when a thunderous knock crashed against the front door and re-echoed through the house. Had Mr. Malcolm MacPherson dropped from the skies? We afterwards discovered that he had come across lots and around the house from the back, but just then his sudden advent was almost uncanny. I ran downstairs and opened the door. On the steps stood a man about six feet two in height and proportionately broad and sinewy. He had splendid shoulders, a great crop of curly black hair, big twinkling blue eyes, and a tremendous crinkly black beard that fell over his breast in shining waves. In brief, Mr. Malcolm MacPherson was what one would call instinctively, if somewhat tritely, a magnificent specimen of manhood. In one hand he carried a bunch of early goldenrod and smoke blue asters. "'Good afternoon,' he said in a resonant voice which seemed to take possession of the drowsy summer afternoon. Is Miss Olivia Sterling in, and will you please tell her that Malcolm MacPherson is here? I showed him into the parlor, then Peggy and I peeped through the crack of the door. Anyone would have done it. We would have scorned to excuse ourselves, and indeed what we saw would have been worth several conscious spasms if we had felt any. Aunt Olivia arose and advanced primly with outstretched hand. Mr. MacPherson, I am very glad to see you, she said formally. "'It's yourself, Nilly.' Mr. Malcolm MacPherson gave two strides. He dropped his flowers on the floor, knocked over a small table, and sent the ottoman spinning against the wall. Then he caught Aunt Olivia in his arms, and smack, smack, smack. Peggy sank back upon the stair-step with her handkerchief stuffed in her mouth. Aunt Olivia was being kissed. Presently Mr. Malcolm MacPherson held her back at arm's length in his big paws and looked her over. I saw Aunt Olivia's eyes roam over his arm to the inverted table and the litter of asters and goldenrod. Her sleek crimps were all ruffled up, and her lace fichu twisted half around her neck. She looked distressed. "'It's not a bit changed you are, Nilly,' said Mr. Malcolm MacPherson admiringly. "'And it's good I'm feeling to see you again. Are you glad to see me, Nilly?' "'Oh, of course,' said Aunt Olivia. She twisted herself free and went to set up the table. Then she turned to the flowers, but Mr. Malcolm MacPherson had already gathered them up, leaving a goodly sprinkling of leaves and stalks on the carpet. "'I picked these for you in the river field, Nilly,' he said. "'Where will I be getting something to stick them in? Here, this will do.' He grasped a frail painted vase on the mantel, stuffed the flowers in it, and set it on the table. The look on Aunt Olivia's face was too much for me at last. I turned, caught Peggy by the shoulder, and dragged her out of the house. "'He will horrify the very soul out of Aunt Olivia's body if he goes on like this,' I gasped. "'But he's splendid, and he thinks the world of her, and, oh, Peggy, did you ever hear such kisses? Fancy, Aunt Olivia!' It did not take us long to get well acquainted with Mr. Malcolm MacPherson. He almost haunted Aunt Olivia's house, and Aunt Olivia insisted on our staying with her most of the time. She seemed to be very shy of finding herself alone with him. He horrified her a dozen times in an hour. Nevertheless, she was very proud of him, and liked to be teased about him, too. She was delighted that we admired him. "'Though to be sure, he is very different in his looks from what he used to be,' she said. "'He is so dreadfully big, and I do not like a beard, but I have not had the courage to ask him to shave it off. He might be offended. He has bought the old Lind place in Avonlea, and wants to be married in a month. But, dear me, that is too soon. It would be hardly proper.' Peggy and I liked Mr. Malcolm MacPherson very much. So did Father. We were glad that he seemed to think Aunt Olivia perfection. He was as happy as the day was long, 
but poor aunt olivia under all her surface pride and importance was not amid all the humor of the circumstances peggy and i snuffed tragedy compounded with the humor mr malcolm macpherson could never be trained to old maidishness and even aunt olivia seemed to realize this he never stopped to clear his boots when he came in although she had an ostentatious new scraper put at each door for his benefit he seldom moved in the house without knocking some of aunt olivia's treasures over he smoked cigars in her parlor and scattered the ashes over the floor he brought her flowers every day and stuck them into whatever receptacle came handiest he sat on her cushions and rolled her antimacassars up into balls he put his feet on her chair rungs and all with the most distracting unconsciousness of doing anything out of the way he never noticed aunt olivia's fluttering nervousness at all peggy and i laughed more than was good for us those days it was so funny to see aunt olivia hovering anxiously around picking up flower stems and smoothing out tidies and generally following him about to straighten out things once she even got a wing and dustpan and swept the cigar ashes under his very eyes now don't be worrying yourself over that nilly he protested why i don't mind a little litter bless you End of chapter 7, part 1